Good evening, everyone. Good evening, warm welcome again to How Hebla Mufa. Warm welcome to Berlinale Talents. In the meantime, we can say good evening, and but we wish you and say hello, good morning, or good afternoon, or whatever you want to. But for us, I think this is, has already been quite a long day here with the talents, starting off in this morning with dream journeys and so on, but also, of course, with the first talks. And we're dreaming on for quite a while. So for now, I think, among the many talents that we have, the 205, uh, I want to highlight and warmly welcome especially the 12 cinematographers that we have this year. So because, as you know, so Berlinale Talents has a variety of different fields of work, 13 in total, and we always try to create that idea of a meeting on your production table. And the cinematographers, of course, play a very, very important f uh, role, not only in the film, but also us here in Talents. And uh, to work with them, uh, we have a camera studio. And the camera studio is a place where we bring them together among themselves. Imagine 12 cinematographers in one room. That never happens on a set. And also, of course, we bring them together with experts from around the world. And one of those experts and mentors uh, is here with us now tonight is Kirsten Johnson. And Kirsten Johnson has been fascinating for us, of course, because of her films behind the camera and in front of the camera. We, she will tell you more about that. But also because of her immediate re uh, approach and response to the idea of the camera studio itself. And I would like to bring Kirsten to me here on screen so that you can see her. And I hope there she is. There she is. Very nice to see you, Kirsten. Thank you very much. Florian. So great to see you. And you already had a first meeting with the camera studio people. So um, you don't need to reveal dreams. So, so what stays in the camera studio can stay in the camera studio. But uh, what was your first impression when you were meeting the 12? Ah, uh, you're correct. We cinematographers love to keep our secrets. <laughs> but um, it was quite magical, I would say, because Almost immediately, there was conversation back and forth, and um, I asked one of um, the talents, Maria, who was originally from Cuba, to tell me a bit of a story. And she told this magical story about seeing her first 35 millimeter projected film. And that film was Paris, Texas. <laughs> and she talked about seeing it in New York City. And before the movie started, she saw this man on the street that she recognized. And it was Alan Berliner, the documentary filmmaker. And she had the courage in that moment to go up to him and tell him uh, that she loved his films. And then they ended up going into the same movie theater together. Now, for me, this is like the perfect story because I feel, you know, we are all sort of in a family, uh, almost a collective unconsciousness of cinema together. Uh, and so I told her that I had seen Alan Berliner's films long ago and then met him in the years before I made Dick Johnson is Dead. And he actually... Um, consulted a little bit on the film. And so I was talking about sort of the ways in which we're all intertwined in some crazy Mobius strip, right? And then um, the wonderful Johannes, who's running the cinematographer's group, sent us into breakout rooms. And there I got to meet a woman named Baraka from Romania, and she was wearing a T-shirt. And guess what it said on her T-shirt? It said, Paris, Texas. <laughs> So there you go. That's how that's how in the zone we are with the cinematographers group. Okay, that sounds fantastic, and I think it's also a good starting point to find out uh, and be even more curious uh, to hear what you are doing now with us, because we decided on a very special way to do it. So uh, you decided on it, and we were happily agreeing. So we leave the floor to you. So because uh, dreaming and speaking about dreams can be something intimate. So you're just with yourself 
and a lot of audience now. And uh, without any further ado, I would even say I will sit down and dream with you from the back. Um, Kirsten, the floor is yours. Well, Florian, Thank I know you you're much. not getting any sleep right now, and none of the talents are either. So if anyone needs to do some lucid dreaming during this talk, fine. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to do my best to be lively and keep everyone awake. Though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I will definitely stay awake. Thank you, Kirsten, for joining us. Thank you for being here with us here tonight. And now, dear audience, dear Kirsten, the floor is yours. Dream on. Thank you. Thanks, Florian. So, you know, I already evoked um, someone in the realm of the mind, Jung, who talks about the collective unconscious uh, of us all. And, you know, there are many theories about how the mind works and how consciousness works. Um, and what Freud would say about dreams is that they're all wish fulfillment. Um, and I could say in a certain way that, that movies are wish fulfillment. Um, but what I want to share with you in this talk is a little bit the way I move in, in and out of um, dreams and inspiration in my thinking about uh, my work. But I'm going to show you some images as I do it, um, because as you can see, I'm a very visual person, as uh, many cinematographers are. And I love um, to see new images and think in the wordless way through images. So um, the wonderful Marius is going to be helping me sort of move through these images. I'm going to give him the cue and he's going to move forward in images. Um, but this first image that we're looking at is an image by Yinka Shonibar, who is an incredible uh, artist who understands in some ways that history is complex. And um, I want to say from the get-go um, that images live long after the people who have made them are dead. So here's my dad, Dick Johnson, with me as an image. Um, he's not dead yet, um, but he's not here with me right now, but his image is here with me now. And my image is there with you now, wherever you are in body and space. Um, so I'm just before I start, I want to think about this idea of credits, permission, acknowledgement, uh, theft. So, you know, um, in many countries in the world today, people start with an acknowledgement of the people whose land that one is on, land that was stolen from native peoples and taken by colonizing peoples. So I don't know where you are in the world, but think about if the land you are sitting on in this moment was stolen from anyone and do a silent acknowledgement to who that might be. I'm gonna just do an acknowledgement of a few of the um, images and artists that I um, draw upon for inspiration that will be in this talk. But I'm not gonna acknowledge everybody because I can't. It would take my entire talk to acknowledge where all of these images come from. Some of them I've made myself. Um, some of them include pictures of my family. Um, and some of the people in the pictures didn't know their image was being taken. So this idea of theft and taking images and stealing images is a thing in our, connects to history in all kinds of ways. Um, so some of the people who are in the talk with me tonight don't know that I am relying upon their images to represent me. And there's, so I think this is really interesting territory for us to think about together. But let me first just say a few names. So I'm gonna say Yinke Shonibar, Saul Steinberg, El Anitsui, Kendrick Lamar, Nick Cave, Shilpa Gupta, Sun Yuan and Peng Yu, and on with the show. So, um, Marius, take us to the next image, which is an eye. Uh, I'm reminding all of us that we're in our bodies in this work and we're in our dreams. And we're doing this with our hearts. So, Marius, take us through to the image that I drew of myself as a child. So we're passing through history, going by way of the heart, uh, to an image of me 
that I drew of myself when I was a six year old. Uh, there I am, kind of a goofy smile. I pretty much look like myself. Um, but I think the other thing we have to like sort of acknowledge is our own history, where we come from at what moment into history we were born and into what bodies we were born and to what family we were born, right? And that is the place from which we do this work, that we do this dreaming of cinema. Uh, and I didn't come from a family uh, that actually was open to cinema. I came from a family uh, that was a religious family and going to movies was something we were not supposed to do. It was actually taboo. Um, I was raised in a Seventh-day Adventist family, but my father was a psychiatrist and my mother was really interested in photography. And so in some ways, um, in the ways that we both embody our parents' wishes and contradict them, um, of course, I got interested in filmmaking. And one of the things that I think about a lot is the way um, that images are different from cameras, are different from humans. But it takes humans and cameras together to create images, and yet images live on without their makers, long after their makers are dead, if they're memorable enough. Um, so go ahead, Marius, you can just sort of start showing images at a reasonable pace. I'm just gonna let it flow along with me and I'll tell you to stop in a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about one of the reoccurring dreams I have. My reoccurring dream is not about flying. My reoccurring dream, and I am literally in it right now, my reoccurring dream that happens is that in my dreams, I see a little red light in the corner and it blinks and it says REC. So, you know, in my life as a camera person, I have traveled to 86 different countries. I have filmed a lot of hours. Ooh, Mario, stop on that one. That's a good one. Um, you're good. Marius is good. But one of the things um, that I think that we all, you know, sort of think about are these different parts and states of our being. So this is a Saul Steinberg drawing, and it says, I do, I have, I am. And for me, Saul Steinberg is one of the sort of ultimate dreamers about what one can do with line and color and composition and imagination. And he's inspired me a lot. And he's part of the inspiration behind the masks in Dick Johnson is Dead. But I think this is one of the things that we all think about a lot of sort of what is the I am. And I've been thinking about it a lot in relation to my dad and how the self changes with dementia and how the self changes after death. Um, I have, and in this drawing, it's a pretty like rickety little I have with clothespins. And I think within cinema, we have to think a lot about um, what we have and what we don't have in relation to other people, in relation to ourselves, in relation to our wish um, to make and to dream and to do, it's always about how much do you have to work with, right? Um, who do you work with and how much money is there? And then of course, there's the I do. And what I love about this drawing is that um, Saul Steinberg's like I do is where the action is at, where the magical, it's in the, it's in the realm of light um, and fantasy and dream. All right, Marius, take it away. Let it keep flowing. Um, the one of the things that I wanted to sort of talk about is the way that in dreams, all kinds of uncanny things happen. Um, things are out of scale. Things are not the way they should be. It's almost like they are a collage. Um, and there's all sorts of sort of taboo things that can happen in film. There can be great contradiction. Um, and they, in many ways, uh, there is no permission necessary everything is allowed. 
stop, says Saul Steinberg with the drawing of his face on his hands, like one of the greatest self portraits ever, right? I'm just going to keep talking with my hand in front of my face. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, go, Marius. Um, so, you know, this, there's a collage that you're seeing here that's the last uh, supper with Colin Kaepernick in the position of Jesus. Uh, ooh, stop on that one. That's my mom and my dad on their wedding day performing uh, that they're having a fight for the camera. In fact, my parents had like a terrible fight on their wedding day. Uh, and from all that I know, they fought like through their entire honeymoon and their entire first year. And then they ended up being married for 50 years. Um, but I certainly um, think about my parents and their dreams and their wishes in reference to what I have been able to do or not able to do in my life and my filmmaking life. And one of the moments that I, you know, will talk about with the camera studio people, but that I want you all to think about is sort of at what moment did you realize that your family um, was different from the rest of the world? And um, think about that moment as we move forward. I'm going to just tell you one story that's not a dream, but a hallucination. Um, and it's fine, Marius, you can keep moving. Um, Oliver Sacks said once uh, that hallucinations happen in a different part of the brain than memory. And a hallucination, when you're experiencing a hallucination, you're actually seeing or hearing or feeling or smelling or tasting. And it suddenly occurred to me that in some ways, movies are more like hallucinations than dreams because we are encountering the actual sense elements that allow us to actually feel things. So um, the other thing that Oliver Sacks said is that it is often the case shortly after death that um, people have hallucinations of their loved ones. And I went to see Fanny and Alexander shortly after my mother had died. I had seen Fanny and Alexander once before. It had probably been about 10 years before. And I went into the theater and none of it was familiar to me, but it was incredibly comforting. And I had forgotten that the boy's father would die and then re-manifest to him. But right before the father reappeared, I suddenly felt a hand on my hand. And it was my mother's hand. I felt my mother's hand on my hand. And then in that moment on the screen appeared the boy's father back from the dead. Um, and, and for me, this is, you know, I think I have many ways in which, which cinema is about like loss and death and then life and the sort of immortality of it and the possibilities of it, um, which is clearly part of what I explore in Dick Johnson is Dead. But one of the things for me that um, I think I am most interested in around movie making at this moment in history. And you'll see a lot of the images that I'm showing you are surrealist or absurdist or have contradictions in them. But I'm really interested in the way that movies are shifting forms right now. And I think that's for many reasons. Um, but among them is the fact that more people who need to make films who haven't had access to making films ever before are getting access. So we're starting to see languages that we've never seen before. We're all sort of familiar with who's been left out. Oh, Marius, you can keep moving. Um, we're aware of like who's been left out of cinema. Um, and in some ways, we all, because we all dream, we can all imagine that like every single person has their own cinema language and could speak in their own terms and how rich our lives would be if we could see in all of these different languages. 
Well, it's a little bit of what's happening right now. I think there's a, like an exploding of genres. There's all kinds of different perspectives coming out. But I think the thing that we are not acknowledging in some ways is how we are all aspirational to things that already exist, right? It's part of what motivates us and helps us imagine. We wanna make a film like, I wanted to make Apocalypse Now. Uh, you know, we have this wish in us and then we do and we realize, oof, I, I, don't, I don't have what it takes to make Apocalypse Now. I am not that. Um, I am not that person in that moment in history. And I don't have access to those things. I can't imagine those things. They aren't actually mine. But for a long time when we're making films, we're sort of dreaming of being other people, right? And then when we see work where we see people who are dreaming in terms of their own language or from their own perspective, it looks new to us and it thrills us, but it also speaks to us and gives sort of space for us in it, right? Um, and part of how it does that is that it leaves space for us in the movies. Um, so, Many of these images um, are images that I took when I visited uh, the Venice Biennale a couple of years ago, which was just incredible to actually get to go there and be there in person, which is no longer the case in this moment in time because of the pandemic. But go to the next image, Marius. This was this incredible um, piece made by Sun Yuan and Peng Yu, which was a machine that was sort of alive and would splatter paint that looked like blood onto the walls and then spend all this time wiping it up again. And then it would do it again. But it moved like, like an animal um, and it was really scary and it made all these kinds of noises. And, and there was like this sort of incredible blood spatter everywhere. And in some ways it was very funny because it would sort of lunge at you and then get back to work. Um, so now I'm gonna tell you another dream of mine that I had when I was working on um, a film in Darfur. And I've worked on many films that have to deal with the aftermath of violence. Oh, Marius, can you, can you go, back to my, go back to my machine of blood? <laughs> Perfect, stay there for a minute. Um, you know, this was, this was not blood, but it looked like it and it left stains and it spattered. And every time the machine threw it out, it did it in a new way, but it sort of kept evoking mass pain, right? And so this, this dream um, I had when I was in Darfur and we were working at the time with a security guard because we were working in conflict zones. And there was a bit of a conflict between me and the security guard because I felt like he always went to fear first. And when I was filming, I was like, can we like, can we stay in like the love and trust zone? And he'd be like, you don't understand how scary it is out there. So the dream is that um, I'm standing with the director of the film uh, in the middle of the desert on the side of this rushing river. And um, the director says, I wanna film that. And I look far, far across the river and there's this tiny fortress um, that I can see far, far across the river. And suddenly the director takes the camera from my hands and jumps into the river with it. And I'm like, oh my Lord. So I jump into the river and I pull the director out and I pull the camera out and we're covered in sand and water. And the security guard comes up and he says, what are you two doing? And, you know, it's sort of clear we've just made this sort of terrible mess of everything. We're covered in, you know, sand and water and spewing and coughing. And I'm wondering whether the camera is ruined. And I said, well, we wanted to film that. And in my dream, I look up. And if you think back to the drawings of Saul Steinberg that I've shown you um, in this conversation, he does these incredible drawings with banners like, I do, I have, I am, right? So I look up and in the middle of this very real desert, there is this giant fortress that is drawn with a pencil and it has these three um, 
banners on it that say pain, power, fear. And I look at that fortress and I say to the security guard, why can't we film that? What is that place? And he said, oh, that's my house. You can't film it. And I said, what do you mean we can't film it? And he said, well, maybe if you use memory photography. And I said, well, what's, what's memory photography? And he said, here's what you have to do for memory photography. You have to take a piece of fabric, very thick piece of fabric, and you have to shield your eyes, cover your eyes. And then you have to project pain, power, and fear onto everyone you see. So I say, I don't think I can do that. That's not my style. And he's like, you've got to try it. So in the dream, I'm suddenly walking around in this incredible marketplace in Sudan with camels and food for sale on market tables, but also AK-47s for sale on tables. And I've got this cloth over my head and I'm trying to film. And I take the cloth from my eyes and I say to the security guard, I can't do it this way. This is not for me. So that's dream number two. All right, Marius, let's move on. Let's move on through our images. Um, so, you know, we're living at this crazy moment in history, right, where we can see images from everywhere in the world. We can see anonymous groups of people protesting for their freedom, trying to use umbrellas to protect them. And yet at the same time, we're all, you know, sort of living in this world of the spectacle of images and we're using images as escapism to sort of free us from this moment in time when we're trapped in our own homes, um, not able to engage with the world. And escapism, I think, um, gets a bad name a lot of the time, gets a bad rap, just like uh, masks do on a certain level. Um, and this is where I think about like, how do we hold the contradictions of this world in our minds? Um, how do we hold the knowledge of the injustice, the violence, um, the histories of misrepresentation? How do we hold that with our aspirations, with our dreams, with our fantasies um, at the same time? And in some ways, like, what we know is we have to engage in the contradiction of it and we have to look at ourselves. Um, if you could just go back one image, Marius, to this crazy, one more backwards to the cheetah who's looking at himself in the mirror. This is a, you know, I saw this in Lisbon um, made out of tile. And I'm, I'm going to say it was like from the 17th century, but I could be wrong. And anyone who looks at the details in the next shot will be able to figure it out. But I just love this moment around representation and sort of trying to see oneself, trying to understand one's animal nature. And um, I'll share this with the um, cinema talent group, but one of my favorite things to think about um, in making cinema is this image of a tiger that has a little monkey sitting on the back of it, holding a steering wheel that's disconnected. And um, the monkey thinks it's driving. And this is an image that is meant to evoke the human unconscious. And so that we all think we're doing something, but in fact, we're sitting backwards on a tiger's butt as the tiger like does what it's gonna do. And that's part of the way I think about movie making, honestly. It's like a director thinks they know where they're headed. A cinematographer thinks we know where we're headed. We're driving like mad, but other things, other magical things are actually happening. So um, go ahead, Marius, leave that cheetah, tiger, leopard behind and head on into the world of more images. Um, so one of our challenges at this moment in history is around how do we delight ourselves with images? How do we transform ourselves? How do we reveal 
the things of this world um, that have been the cause of pain and are continuing to cause pain. Um, all of these are sort of in our challenges, right? Um, but we know, we know we can't do it by making banal things that other people have seen before, because who wants to look at that? We've got to see in new ways. And we've got to acknowledge for ourselves that we have blind spots, our own blind spots. And I think that can be one of the most sort of powerful and painful parts of being involved in filmmaking is that one doesn't want to acknowledge how capable we are of doing harm with our own images, how much we don't understand about the world, how much we don't understand about what cinema is and can do. Um, but sort of, you know, back to the idea of collaboration and why collaboration is so critical. We, when we work with other people, we have the capacity to understand ourselves in ways that we can't see for ourselves. Um, so I've got this image, this beautiful image of a mirror being held by a person, leave the octopus behind, go to the yes with tentacles, which I say yes to cinema at all times, um, to the next image, which is um, an image of a mirror and hands holding a mirror and hands holding a mirror, right? And it's like, like, where is the camera in this? Where is the blind spot? How is this image possible? And I think that's the wonder for those of us who really pay attention to images. We've seen a lot of images. We are looking for things that surprise us, that reveal things to us in new ways and things that um, help us understand our own lives. Um, so go ahead, Marios, take off again. Um, we're gonna move through some images that inspired me and incredible images of Zama. Um, and you'll see in my collection that I have lots of eyes. That's one of my personal obsessions, right? Is the eye itself and how it functions. Um, but I, I do believe that dreams help me figure out my own life. And um, one of the dreams that, keep on going, Marius, just let it flow. There you go. <laughs> um, the next dream that I want to tell you about is um, the dream that came adva in advance of the dream that inspired Dick Johnson is dead. So I, my mother had Alzheimer's for many years. And at the very end of her life, we moved her into a dementia care facility. I really didn't want to. And when we got her there, we put up a lot of pictures and an images of our family on the wall. And she said to me, oh, is our family here? And I said, yes, everyone's here. We're all here with you. And um, she said, yes, I can see them. I recognize some of these eyes. And then she looked out the window and got very cold and very distant. And she said, are you leaving me here? I'm going to get teary. Tears are going to come out of my eyes. And I said, well, mom, you know, we, we think you'll be safer here and you'll be taken care of here. And, and she said, we'll be in touch which was brutal. And I, you know, got her set up there and then I headed back out into the world to make films. And I had to leave her as many of us have to leave people or be separate from the people we love when we make films. And one of the things that I noticed when we put her in that facility was that the sheets weren't very good. They were these very like sort of polyester sheets and not very comfortable. And I my thought upon leaving her there was, I've got to get decent sheets for her. And then I didn't do it. And she died while I had gone off to Darfur. And I was thinking about how does my film work, like wrestle with the pain and injustice of the world. And meanwhile, my mother was sleeping on polyester sheets. And there you have it. I got back from Darfur. The day I got back, she died. Uh, you can leave it on that image for a minute. Marius, because it's like touching the shadow, right? Touching the impossible, um, the crack in the void between all of us. 
Um, and I had a dream that was inspired by a Carlos Regatas movie, Carlos Regatas, the great filmmaker, Mexican filmmaker, um, in which I saw my mother lying on a bed and there were a group of people all gathered around and I think they were all Hutterites like the people in Carlos's movie. And suddenly my mom sat up and she said, oh, don't worry about it. My daughter got me this incredible bed and she was like on one of those Swedish beds that cost like $60,000 or something. And she said, and my daughter got me this cashmere t-shirt and I'm really comfortable. And then she lay down and died. And apparently people say like when your parents who've died or people that you love have died, come back to you in dreams, it's called a big dream. But that dream was a big dream for me in terms of my capacity to say, it's okay. We did everything we could and, and my mother is comfortable now. Clearly I was slightly uncomfortable with that because I made Dick Johnson is dead. But let's move forward through the images, Marius. And lots of these images are images of books that inspire me, work of other photographers that inspire me, and sort of the idea of play how do we let play enter our work? And one of the things that I do a lot is to take images um, that have inspired me or belong to me in that they are my family or an image that I've taken. And then I'll take a picture of it um, and sort of move it around, make a collage of it with another image or another idea. So keep on going, Marius. That's a wonderful collective of Sudanese photographers um, who, that I learned about after working in Darfur. Keep going, keep going, keep going, Marius. Um, and the other thing that I like to do is sort of enter photos with my hands. Um, and part of that for me is about breaking this edge, right? The edge of this screen and this frame to remember that bodies are present to make images. And bodies are around the images. We inhabit the sort of 360 degree, all kinds of scale space around images. And yet images sort of pretend to us that they're flat and they simply exist. Um, keep going, Marius. So this is a little piece of paper in which I write ghost image, memory in the image, photo as memory. And that's just like a note that I wrote. I don't know when, and I found it and I took a picture of it move forward. Um, this is a picture of books on my shelf and the way they sit together. I often arrange them by color, which is part of how I remember um, things. I remember things visually. Keep going, Marius. Um, so here's one of my collages. So this is this incredible um, woman from Bosnia who is in my film camera person. And, you know, we were trying to ask her about the genocide in Bosnia. She didn't want to talk about it. And then I interrupt and sort of say, did you always have such a great sense of fashion? And she says, yes. And she goes on to say this incredible thing about how she always loves fashion and um, that she's always tried to dress well. Um, but that after she dies, that, that her family should cut up her clothes and make new clothes um, to remember her by and to wear them with joy. And so I think about that with images um, and how we make, that we're sort of taking fragments of the world and recombining it and cutting it and putting it back together in ways that make sense to us in combinations that make sense to us. So I took an, a photo, I think from Ireland in the 50s that says we mourn all the dead. And I put this on this woman's next to this woman's image because when I went back to Bosnia to show the family this movie, she had died a month before she got to see herself sort of be the star of camera person, which nearly killed me. I was so upset she didn't get to be in this. And I wrote down below, she died before her image was on the screen. And yet many of you who have seen camera person know her and she made you laugh. And somehow she's like shining through this image and alive in this image. Um, go to the next image, Marius, and it's a postcard um, from the early turn of the century. And it said, I had this image 
years before I filmed the tunnels of Bosnia. So in some ways we see the world because of the way we've already seen it. Um, and I think that's the challenge, especially if there have been, you know, dehumanizing representations that get repeated and repeated and repeated. And this is absolutely true of cinema. We repeat racist, we repeat sexist, we repeat these ways of diminishing and not seeing people and enforce it and we teach other people through it. So it's like, how do we find ways to acknowledge the pain of history, but also to transform it and allow? So, you know, all of these questions float through my head and they're questions. Um, Dick Johnson is dead. Go on to the next image. Um, Maya, so this is my dad, that's my dad. <laughs> He's all over the place. So the dream I had about my dad um, was that I saw a man in an open casket and I didn't recognize him. And he sat up and he said, I'm Dick Johnson and I'm not dead yet. And it was like a wake up call to me. I did not consciously realize to myself at that moment, I was like a monkey with the steering wheel attached to nothing, um, that my father's dementia had already begun. It was too painful for me to imagine that my father would also get dementia because my mother had already done it, right? Um, and I think there is a way in which humans are like, no, I can't take anymore. I've already been through this. And I think we're all feeling that at this moment in the pandemic, like enough already. Haven't we already been through a year of this? But, you know, life ain't like that. <laughs> all right, Marius, go ahead and, and um, start these images back up again. You know, this was an image of my son, Felix, with a halo of pencils. Um, the pencil halo being artwork made by somebody else. And I had him stand in front of it um, and took the picture of him. And um, keep going, Marius. I love the way humans transform ourselves and do it through fantasy and through object. And that's sort of what cinema is, is taking the human face and transforming its meaning. Um, so keep on going, keep on moving through all my various headdresses made of plastic bags, uh, towers of hair, um, my personal favorite, um, a headdress of iguanas. These are all dreamscapes. Um, and keep on moving, Marius. We're going to go to Haiti, an incredible painting of Carnival that I own that's all about um, being brave in the face of death and in some ways celebrating and playing in the face of death. Um, and so, you know, it's like these objects are in our lives made by humans who have experienced things. So this painting, um, go ahead and show the next image by an anonymous Haitian painter given to me by Haitian filmmaker Getty Thelan. Um, it inspired me unconsciously without words as a part of the making of Dick Johnson is Dead. Um, so just keep on moving, Marius, through several of these images. I'm just sort of showing you the things and the objects that are in my world, the images that are in my world. Um, and go ahead and make it to the melting snow cone on the ground. So for me, this was a snow cone that I saw on the ground um, in a little town in Ecuador. And... I think about this a lot with making films is that like we try to pretend that we know we try to hold it all together and sort of make a perfect snow cone and have it colored in the colors we want it to be and to stop time but in fact one this whole place is melting the planet's melting right it matters what we do time is of the essence People in the future will look back at us and sort of wondered, what were you doing? Didn't you see what mattered? And we're like, I'm here making this beautiful, glorious snow cone. It's going to taste so delicious and be so delicious and make me feel so good, right? Yes. And time's running out. Things are melting. And also, can we let go of our belief that we can control everything? that we can change everything. 
how do we be in this contradiction of we want to fight for a world that we love and we also desperately need to escape all of its pain this is what the sort of question marks of cinema allow us this is the territory that they allow us to play in um so keep on going marius let's see where we go next um oh i'm just this is like a slight detour to the pleasures of food and color which in many ways we all know we need to nourish ourselves um, to survive and part of what art does is help us survive um, but not just to survive for survival sake keep on going marius keep on make it through the garlic through the hot peppers um, and a film that I discovered recently was this incredible film by Larissa Shipko that she made in 1971 called The Ascent. Um, and keep on going, Marius, just make it through all of the pleasures of being alive in the present moment. And this incredible film where sort of two men are trying to survive in the winter and Russia, and they do everything to survive until the very end where one of them refuses to compromise his principles and so is hanged and is killed along with a lot of other people. The film takes place during World War II. Um, keep on going, Marius. And um, the other man who does want to live, and the whole movie is about like, I want to live, I want to survive, I want to survive, I want to live. Well, he sells out and he sells out. Um, and it's amazing because the filmmaking just shifts in that moment. And even though he's still alive, he loses all will to live because he realizes he's sold his soul to the devil. Um, and this is one thing that I think a lot about um, with filmmaking is sort of this this struggle and this contrast. And here my son's under his like army military camouflage in front of the Christmas tree, right? But this is what it is, our lives. And oh, guess what? The tree's here with me uncanny objects, just like in dreams, things popping up in ways that you didn't expect them to. Um, so let's go back to Dick Johnson is dead. And um, as we start to wrap this out, you can keep going forward, Marius, a little bit. Um, I, I realized, some part of me realized that my father was going to die and that I was not ready for death and that I was going to rage against it and sort of play with it. And I thought, what better place to do that than cinema? And in some ways, this is the skull and crossbones drawing of Dick Johnson. Um, in some ways, I knew that I would fail. And I think this is what we're so afraid of in cinema is failing, not being able to express the dream that we have, the aspirational dream, like this aspirational dinner table I've got here on my dad's casket. Um, but in some ways knowing if I was gonna try to make a film in order that my father might live forever, I knew it would never work. And somehow part of that failure freed me up. Um, and I think that's the thing that I want to sort of say and speak to all of you. Um, in this cohort, you know, and I, when I say in this cohort, this is a public talk available to talents, but also available to many people out there in the world. We don't know where you are. We don't know whose ancestral lands you are on. We don't know who you have lost in this pandemic time, who you are afraid of losing. Um, and yet we're all together in this space dreaming of a different world, hoping for a different world, and yet in the world that we're in, in the bodies that we're in, in the places that we're in, and we're trying to figure out how do we speak our own language. Um, and Dick Johnson is dead, is like my sort of struggle to find a language in which I could speak about these like incredibly crazy contradictions, right? That I don't want my dad to have dementia. I don't want him to die. I want him to have a sudden death because I don't want this death to drag on forever. I want him to go to heaven, but I don't want him to go there because then I won't get to see him anymore. I want him to be, his body to be transformed uh, for his feet that he was born without toes to be healed. But in fact, that's impossible because 
If Dick Johnson had toes, he wouldn't be Dick Johnson, right? So that cinema can sort of find ways to hold all of our questions and contradictions is what I believe in. That's that's my dream of what cinema has done for me, will do for me, is for me. Um, and I think in some ways um, that we all, we all have this, this wish um, that cinema can make everything, everything beautiful, but cinema won't do that for us. Cinema can hold all of the contradictions. Cinema can hold our questions. Cinema can hold our pain um, and uh, our love and our joy. So I think, Marius, I, I actually want to <laughs> head to that last image of Dick Johnson is dead, good grief. Um, and then to blow it back out to um, the next project that I'm working on, which is the next image, um, which is called Camera People of the 21st Century. And I'm headed back out into the world to ask the questions that I have to ask about what images are doing to us and doing for us, because I do think we're at an unprecedented moment in human history. I think you all know it. I think we've all got these things these cell phones that um, give us the capacity to speak in images to each other. And yet we all understand there are consequences and blind spots to this that are beyond our human imagination, just as this pandemic has been beyond our imagination. Um, so I'm gonna go back out into the world um, to be with audiences, with fellow cinematographers, with fellow filmmakers, as I am with you now. Um, in the next project I'm making, because I think we need a collective, um, a collective acknowledgement of the big questions that are facing us, because this is a high stakes game and we want to live forever. Uh, I think that's it. I think I'm going to wrap it right there in that fancy with a bow on it way, if um, that's okay with Florian and the team. They're like, we didn't see you stopping, KJ. We thought you would go on forever. We're not even really here. <laughs> Are you there? I feel like, I feel like you're there. I know you're there. I can see them all coming back. They're here. Joao says they're here. Yes, look at that. I'm making people run onto the stage. I love it. You're live, your yeah. body. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Can you hear us? <laughs> I'm even with my mask. <laughs> so oh, I fantastic. love it. We're Thank you very together. much. I think we are still live. Uh, and I think uh, this, this gives us this opportunity. Alive. To thank you, Kirsten, for that fantastic uh right and journey so i wasn't asleep it looks a little bit as if i'm just awaking from a deep deep sleep here but i'm still here <laughs> and i was awake sitting here following all those fantastic images and uh we wanted to thank you from the uh deepest heart uh, we can do here so i had the team here with me we were looking at your photos um and i think also this came through to the audience unfortunately there's no big applause at this very moment but we give you one um, and uh, I'm very, very happy that you, you can meet the talents in the next day. So because, uh, as you also said, you, you are going to have questions. You want to meet the camera persons and also, I think, sure, certainly other people. And we'll offer you opportunities for that in the next days. To the audience, I have to say thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for being with us here in the How Hebel Am Ufa. Um, and of course, uh, hopefully we see each other again very soon uh, for other talks uh, and other meetings and webinars and so on, so that we can also have you here with us and dream on. Thank you very and much for joining. Kirsten, do you want to add something? <laughs> I did. You know, I, I, 
know, I just had to thank Marius because he killed it with the images. He like he was right there with me. He was listening. He went backwards. He went forwards. And I think this is what, you know, we do in cinema. We collaborate well together. We acknowledge our collaborators. We time travel together. We we move through portals of space together. So thanks, Marius, and thanks to the entire team. You're welcome. Wow and Pola in the invisible space behind you, Florian. Yeah, I can only copy that. Thank you very much to the team. Thank you, Marius. And again, nice to have you here. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.